Has the Lord been speaking to you in the past episodes? Has he been speaking to the guy in your chair, I mean? Not the guy next to you, but the guy in your chair. Uh, I hope so. Uh, we started brainwashed landing with the Apostle Paul writing to a group of pretty rowdy guys in the Corinthian church. And he writes to them in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, because they kind of got stuck believing lies. They got stuck believing myths about all the truth that Paul originally taught them in the gospel. So he comes in and says, how you believe in this stuff? And uh, he labeled a lie believed then lived as a stronghold in the verse. And he says, we to pull down strongholds, he, say, he tells them. Strongholds are lies believed then lived. Yeah. And uh, he tells them something else. He tells them we, uh, we are to take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. But what does that mean? What does it mean when you're anxious and your head is going like this? What does that mean when fear rejection has made you so angry you feel like someone took advantage of you and you got to tell them how you feel, but you shouldn't? What does it mean when the impatience just attacks us and it turns into anger with our family? Yeah, what is, what, you know, what, how do you take those thoughts captive? Well, we spoke about the word thought not being a single thought, but used as schemes, plans, and a pattern of thinking. So what Paul was telling these guys, listen, this conceptual way you're thinking is wrong. But that's how it is with all lies, isn't it? Psychiatrists uh, call... Uh, Jung said, the, the healthiest thing a man can do with his life is to consider what myths he's living his life in. Yeah. I like what Paul said better. Cast him down. <laughs> cast, cast him down with truth. But uh, we, we came away from our first session with this. The man who does not take his thoughts captive will, say will, will be taken captive by his thoughts. And uh, I know that's true for me. I know that's true for me. If I, if I get passive and I'm not guarding my heart, that Proverbs 4.23 tells me to do, if I'm not guarding my heart and mind in Christ Jesus, in my submission and surrender to the Holy Spirit, I'm a mess. How about you? Yeah. Let me ask you another question. Did you ever do a tug of war? Did you ever do a tug of war? How many of you have been there, did one tug of war in your lifetime? Yeah, I think it's, and how many of you all did it at a picnic or high school, something with junior high school? How many hate it? Yeah. Uh, yeah well, you don't like it when you're on the losing side. And uh, I, I saw this picture, and it reminded me of how I felt. You know what I felt when I was on the losing side? Totally helpless. I felt my feet sliding in the mud, feeling totally weak and incapable. And no matter how hard I pulled, I just kept going the other way. It's a lot like that with our thoughts. When you and I battle with the brainwashing that society has given the Christian man. For today, the Christian man has less influence on society than society has on the Christian man. And what we find, we feel ourselves slipping and slipping into it and slipping into it. It comes through entertainment. It comes from always having to have fun. It comes through sporting events. All good things that when we turn into a God thing becomes a bad thing. Yeah, these are good things. They're meant for our enjoyment. And here's the thing. You really can't enjoy them well when they're put first before God, if you're a Christian believer. But boy, can you enjoy your wife and kids. Boy, could you enjoy everything that God gives you. You can enjoy a baseball game. Well, not in New York this year, but you can enjoy a baseball game in a wonderful, wonderful way. Why? Because God's first, not the baseball. How do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So here we go. We're dealing with our thoughts here. We're dealing with our thoughts, and it's vital that we understand them. It's vital 
that we know how to battle. We went to part two, and uh, we, we said in Brainwash part two that whatever a man resists in his flesh, meaning thoughts, when thoughts come in, if you resist in the flesh, they'll persist in the flesh. Meaning without the Holy Spirit, you're a Ghana. <laughs> you're dog meat. Okay, because the spirit realm beats up our flesh every time. You see? Not to mention, without the spirit realm, we're living with a liar. Then people know you're living with a liar. It's called your old man. Yeah, man, when he, he sees that spirit coming in, he puts it up. He goes, nah, nah, we don't really need that right now. Get distracted over here to the left. I know you're reading that Bible. I know you're praying, but get distracted here. I know you're doing this, but we have to attend to this. And then the spirit says, no, one minute with me is greater than three days without me. Amen. You see, and the spirit cries out that, but the flesh says, no, 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 that's not reasonable. It's not logical. That's what goes on inside our head. Mm. We moved over to the third process. Renouncing our thoughts. And what that is, is really cutting the legs out of our standards and values. Totally cutting them and, and right at the root. And what does it mean? Ungodly standards and values is what drives desires. Desires is what drives sin. Ungodly desires drives sin. You see, so we don't mess with the desire. We get the root of our value. Do I need to go over that again? But we're good with that, right? Because uh, go back and look at the previous uh, videos. But what we did say is the man who confesses sin receives Forgiveness. The man who renounces sin receives freedom. Okay, this is great. Uh, something I believe was important that we brought up last week. Repentance agrees with how you sinned. Repentance agrees with how you sinned. You're agreeing. That actual word confess means agreement. That's what it means. The word confess. Confess your sins. Agree that you sinned. Agree. And we said last week, repentance agrees with how you sinned. Renunciation agrees with why you sinned. It doesn't even deal with your desires. It deals with, renunciation deals with these old ungodly ways that we still value over God's ways. It's a subconscious deal. We don't even realize we're doing it. So we ask ourselves the question, what myth am I living holding on to old values? It's usually with money. It's usually with power. It's usually with sex. We don't need it. We, we, we could go to other things. There's a lot of other things. And you could apply it. But we come to our last topic in how to take our thoughts captive by speaking about rest. Rest by releasing. See, you've done a lot of work in your resistance and your renunciation of a thought. You've done a lot of work. Now's the time to get out of your own way and let God take care of it. And rest is so much more, and we're going to go through it, rest is so much more than just trusting God. It's the bridge that rest crosses to get to the other side in your heart, but it is so much more because uh, we could just say that and go home and that would be very true. But uh, let's go to our anchor scripture today and that is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 and after that verse 11. It says this, it says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest, let's stop there, Entering his rest. What is that all about? Entering his rest still stands. When you see the word rest, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The Sabbath. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, sleep. Uh, the Sabbath. Stopping work. Working only six days a week. That's a physical rest. Yeah. When you go and you come home and some of you, you had a tough day, I know and your brain is fried, and there's too much pressure, and then you come home to pressure sometimes, and it's just not fun. You need a psychological rest, a mental rest. You see, God 
is talking about a spiritual rest here. Israel was not able to enter into that rest. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, meaning he gave it to Israel, and they said no. They said no. We will not enter that rest by their disobedience. But it still stands for you and I in this room here tonight. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Fallen short of what? The rest. You are called to be careful and to really focus on this rest. Gentlemen, we're going to say this a lot later, but rest is one of your greatest weapons of warfare. Rest is one of your greatest weapons of warfare. Do not let this admonition go by. It says here, let's be careful that none of you, zero, be found to have fallen short of it. Is that a command? I hear a command in there. I hear an imperative in there. You see, then it goes on to verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort. Say make every effort. You see this make every effort? This is a Greek word, the root word spadazo. Make every effort. That means make haste, make business. Go at it with your tongue hanging out. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm supposed to go after rest with my tongue hanging out. So when I'm exhausted, I'll drop? No. Rest has little to do with exhausting your flesh, but all to do with refreshing your spirit. That's important we understand that. It's not about, rest has little to do with the exhaustion of your flesh. Is that what I said? That's what you said. Okay. But has more to do with the refreshment of your spirit. You see, that is vital for us to understand here. It's a spiritual rest you're offered. Make every effort. To do what? Make every effort to do what? To enter that rest. I mean, do you really need to go to two other verses to get this? I mean, do you really need to need more? You, you could read all of Hebrews chapter 3 and all of Hebrews chapter 4, and it'll, it'll kind of explain a little more, of course, in context, but it tells you with these two verses, I say, Lord, do I need any other two verses than this? No. Make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. He's talking about the Hebrews in the desert, in the Exodus. Rest is a powerful weapon of warfare. We go at it and we focus on the rest because if we don't focus on the rest. St. Augustine said, our hearts remain restless until they are in Christ Jesus. We're designed to be restless until you and I are in and one and abide in Christ. Rest is a weapon. Rest is a position. Rest is a person. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Now, the rest that we're talking about, again, doesn't mean we're free from all problems. But it is a freedom of being bothered by every single one of them. Does that make sense? In other words, your rest is not going to prohibit problems. Sure, a physical rest will. Sure, a mental rest will. Your spiritual rest, your spiritual rest is going to invite blessing. It's going to invite blessing because it's a commandment of God. He calls it the Sabbath rest, you see. But it's so much more than a physical rest here. Isaiah uh, 30, 15. This is a favorite of so many of us. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In returning and what? This is, this is Israel going through this cycle of Israelistness. I made up that word just now. Yeah, uh, Israelism. Okay, meaning, ah, oh, blessing. Oh, let's look at it. Blessing. Oh, it's car- you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Here, it's disobedience. They're afraid in chapter 30 of Isaiah to be attacked by the Assyrians. They're afraid. And uh, they have Egypt as their New York City, as their government. And they start relying on Egypt more so, and God is not happy. 
God is not happy and he's put, he's put in 13th place again. So he says this through the prophet, hey, Israel, in returning and rest, this word returning in some places means repentance. In, ret in returning and rest, in me, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. Gentlemen, the reward of rest is strength. The reward of rest is strength. Spiritual strength from your father. Sure, there'll be physical strength. Sure, there'll be mental strength. That, you're going to get that just by stopping. But God wants you to stop and be still and do so much more than natural rest. What, is he, what does he want? Well, first we have to understand rest is not found in relinquishing responsibility. Because sometimes when we rest, we start feeling guilty, right? Some of you guys are going, no, I'm pretty good with rest. <laughs> rest is not found in relinquishing responsibility, but in relinquishing controllability. You're releasing, you're, relinqu you're relinquishing, not your ability, because <laughs> that's a stronghold. You can't control your life. We can influence parts, but sometimes it runs over to a stronghold thinking that we control our lives. Now, you cannot control your thoughts. Some of us think we can. You cannot control your thoughts. The thoughts that go on in your subconscious, you don't touch till they get to the conscious mind and they come up in pretty weird ways sometimes. 90 something percent of the people suffer with intrusive thinking, intrusive thoughts. They just, they just take, take hold of us and we walk around for a minute or two and we feel like we're in a daze. Goes, what just happened? How many people understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then when you're a godly guy, after that, you hear a little voice going, Christians don't think like that. And you, and you go, they don't? And he says, and another voice goes, you're a fake. I, I am? You're not holy. You've been at this thing for 10 years. And you can't even, you can't even stop the F-bombs from coming out of your mouth. You can't even stop look, Googling at that girl. Googling? Yeah? Oogling. Oogling. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I knew there was a, I knew there was a oogle in there. Rest is not found in relinquishing responsibility, but in relinquishing controllability. And like we say, if you think you're in control of your life, that's your first stronghold. You can only influence certain areas. We're not in control. Mike, have you been in control of your life this uh, past week? No. You felt pretty in control the week before, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, you say, Scott, how do we battle our thoughts? How do we do this? How do we come to rest? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. And we're going we're gonna to speak about how because it's so vital. It's so vital you wouldn't believe it. Well, you would believe it after we're finished. But I'm going to go through four steps of rest. And uh, I'm not going to leave you hanging as we close this uh, series. I'm going to go through four steps of rest. Brainwashed. The battle for your mind. These four steps is what I have received for myself to get out of my own way. When my thoughts start going south. When they start going sideways. And this works because it's pure scripture. It's, it's a scriptural blueprint, scriptural blueprint, but this is my own that I personally do that works for me just about every single time I do it because he is faithful not once in a while. He's faithful all the time. And I'd like to go over that with you now. These four steps. Number one, be still. In his wonder. The fear of the Lord has been lost, in my opinion, the fear of the Lord has been lost in this day and age with men. Uh, I am probably one of the biggest uh, uh, 
criminals over this in my past. You know when I would talk to God? When I was on the toilet bowl. When I was in, when I was in my car. When it was convenient for me, then I would stop and I would talk to God. And He's so good, He, he, he doesn't get offended. He just, did, you know, there's, there's an immature Christian man like me. Okay, because it's the only time I stop to think. When, when we're on the toilet, sometimes we're in the car. Our minds are running like this. So I have come into a love of my Father. I have come into, here's the word, awe. We call it awe-ism. Awe-ism. Yeah. Did you just make up that word? I'm not sure. But we call it orism. It's called, in theological terms, the fear of the Lord. And that is an awe of God when you sit there. And here's what I want you to do first. As you're dealing with your thoughts, the Bible tells us to meditate day and night. It tells us to fill our mind with God's thoughts. When you sit there, I'd like you to take seven to eight seconds of breathing. Try it now. Breathe in. Just breathe, breathe in. If you do it just for five seconds, it'll work. What you're doing is you're being still and you're pausing. What? What are you pausing? Be still and know that I am what are the two ways we please God? It says in Hebrews 11.6. Knowing that He is to be celebrated, He is God, and He exists, number one. Number one. All right, we could do that. And number two, faith. You please Him by faith. These are the two areas He is pleased. So I guess you got to believe Him <laughs> and to have faith. You know, but those are the two areas Hebrews 11.6 says. By faith, and it says that he's to be celebrated as a rewarding God. So you're sitting there in expectation. Expectation, but a peace and a calm. It says, uh, I, what I like doing is thinking of the Psalm 23 too. And I say, you lead me. I don't lead me. You lead me beside still waters of rest. Now you say, Scott, what does this have to do with battling our thoughts? It has everything to do with where we're going. So, Psalm 23, 2 says, He leads me beside still and restful waters. Just breathe that in. So we're still. We're submitted. We're submissive to the Lord. Means we're submissive to His Word. We're submissive. So we're sitting there and just allowing the Holy Spirit to bring to mind. You could have your Bible there, that's fine. You could be reading certain areas. We're sitting there and allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to us. This is very different for us, because I don't know about you, I go at it when I read my Bible. I could be sweating stuff, and sometimes I'm, you know, I'm enjoying it so much, I get so excited. I, sometimes I can't read it before bed because I get too excited. And people know what I'm talking about. You just get pumped. Because God's Word does that to us addictive Jesus guys, you know? So in order to get to sleep sometimes, I have to, I have to calm down. But I sit there and I ask Him, what is it you want to see? Bring a truth to my mind from your Word. I don't need to understand it. I just need to know what truth it is. This is resting. This is a rest. And He'll say things like, He'll impress things upon you like, draw near to me like you're doing, and I will draw near to you. And you'll have the power to resist those thoughts, those evil thoughts, because you draw near to me, and I draw near to you. And go, okay, Lord. You know, sometimes you'll go, Lord, is this all about you? And you want, yeah, okay, it is, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, I got, I got that, I could do that, I could do that. And he says, abide in me. Stay here. You know, abiding is not a place or something that you do to go do. Do you, do you understand that? Abiding means to remain where you are. 
So you're abiding in Christ. You feel the peace of God coming over the room right now? Yeah, this is the Holy Spirit that you're experiencing now. And the abiding is if we abide in Him. It says if we abide by obedience, by His Word, and by His love. If we abide in that, He will abide in us. We do, He does. We abide in His Word of truth. So we're submissive to His Word. So how does that work when we get a thought in our mind? When we get negative thinking and thoughts in our mind, the first thing we do is pause and we're still. Me personally, what I like doing, I like be still. Lord, it's all you. It's all you, Father God. And then my truth that I love saying, I say, that's not who I am. With that nasty thought that just come, that's not me. That's not me. Man. Yeah, it, and if it's not my old man, it's a bunch of chemicals figuring out some stuff that's trying to get up, you know. And uh, but you know, that's what I mean. You're right. You're right, Augie. It's not. It's not me. It's my old man. That's what I, what I call being submissive. See, that's the truth he brings up. He goes, that's not who you are. Now you got to graduate to that. If the thought bothers you too much, if you're too angry over the thoughts. You can't do that. The minute you get angry, you lose submission. The minute you get angry, you lose your stillness. In quietness, in quietness, come on, and trust is your strength. In quietness. You don't need to be doing brave, heroic, physical things Amen. to be a man of God. Be surrendered. Be surrendered to God's will. You say, well, that's easy. That's easy. It is the hardest thing in the world. If, I, if you went to God, and, uh, and I told you, be surrendered, and the Bible tells us a lot. Uh, Jesus set an example for us by surrendering at the cross. He did it. He did it. Jesus' will was kind of not to go to the cross, but his greater will was to please the Father. The greater will was to please the Father. And thank goodness he did. Thank goodness he did, because by him not getting saved, you and I got saved. By him, not being, by him being forsaken, you and I will never, ever, say ever, never. ever be forsaken. But be surrendered to God's will. Now here, I'm going to throw something at you here. How do I know God's will is the first thing you say. You have, uh, you're, you're having a rough marriage, let's say. And uh, you're losing attraction to your wife. You could be in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. And you're losing attraction to your wife. And thoughts of old girlfriends start coming. Thoughts of pornographic images start popping up in your mind. And uh, you're like, oh, still got to deal with this stuff. And you're like, and you start asking, Lord, I need these thoughts to go away. They're slowing me down. They're slowing us down. And is it God's desire that your thoughts be pure? Yes. Then why doesn't he just go, Whew. Because he leaves it up to us through this. A whole life is spent here. Here's the prayer. It's what I do, and I believe it's biblical, when we want to know God's will. Rather, when we're not sure of God's will, which usually covers 90-something percent of your prayers outside of what's declared in Scripture. You know, it doesn't tell me if I should go to the movies tomorrow night. It doesn't tell me which movie to go to. Okay, it tells me how to behave. <laughs> it tells me to ask, and it'll give me wisdom to make the decision. See, the Bible doesn't have every answer, but it gives you wisdom to have every answer. Mm. The Bible brings you wisdom. It's not an answer book. The, you know, what should we do? Should we start this at 7 or start this at 6? He gives you wisdom for that. He doesn't come and go start it at 6, although he does that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't come next week at 6. <laughs> but here's what we do. Very important, very important. What you're asking the Lord to do, even if it's taking away a negative thought, even if it's something as serious as healing a loved one, the way you find out the Lord's will is you ask, and you, in your mind, say, Lord, how could this not be your will to heal her? How could this not be your will to bless that person? How could this not be your will 
to heal me of my pornography sexual thoughts. How could this be of your will to leave me here? You ever think like that? Mm -hmm. Well, what I have found very successful is saying, maybe it's not supposed to be, because you know greater than I do. Maybe this person is supposed to pass, but the pain of me being separated for this person is just, I just can't handle it. I mean, come on, when a five-year-old child is sick or a five-year-old child, the, your, your mind just does not wrap around it. Your spirit just has to surrender because you don't know. You're so tied up. We're so tied up with our loved ones. We're so tied up in what happens. Now, let's move over to the thoughts that we're talking about. Now, the thoughts we're talking about here, the thoughts that come in, you don't surrender to the thoughts. You surrender to the fact and accept the fact that they're coming. That they're going to come. They're going to continue to come. And you're not going to reach a level in your life where you don't get negative thinking. You know, some of the greatest teachers I know say they're 15 minutes from depression. You know, we say five minutes from stupid here. You know what I'm saying? Or five steps from stupid. So number one is to surrender to the fact that God may choose to leave it for specific purpose to drive you closer to Him. But even saying drive you closer to Him, you're trying to understand. When God doesn't make sense is when you surrender. See, surrender for the world is waving a white flag. It's defeat after battle. Surrender for the believer <coughs> precedes battle because victory is in the hands of a trusted king. You've now surrendered and you surrendered to His will. And now you're, a keyword, accepting the fact even greater that we are sinners. Our thoughts are not pure. We get very impatient at times. Girls still make our eyes turn around. Not you guys, guys out of here, not you guys on Zoom, but uh, other guys on other Zooms. But we still ogle. You know, we, we don't ogle. We do it like professional Christians. Inside we go, wow, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. God made a beautiful woman. Yeah. Amen. Yes, I don't. I was only kidding. I was only kidding. Uh, my, my point here is, see, when you accept that, you start going through the cycle again of repentance and renunciation of the thought. And here's what happens. The rest starts attacking you because you've surrendered to his will, not what you want, but what he wants. You're obsessed about money or losing your job. Lord, how do you squash that? By accepting the fact you don't know. It may be God's will you do lose your job. Now, don't anybody use that as an excuse to do the opposite. Here's my point. You have to ask God the opposite of what you want. That's how you surrender to his will. You don't ask him to do the opposite of what you want, but and nor can you control it. What you do is say, Lord, thy will be done, even if I'm asking for the wrong thing. God honors that. So we're still, we're submissive, we're surrendered. And after this, we are strengthened in the Lord. Because rest is not achieved. Rest is received. And like love, you need to be strengthened in the Lord to receive his love, and to receive his rest. The power to rest in Christ is in proportionate to your submission to Christ and his word. The power to rest in Christ is in proportionate to your submission to Christ, meaning his word. Be still in his wonder. Be submissive to his word. Be surrendered to his will. And be strengthened. Be strengthened. How? In all your worth. Because when you come to the conclusion that it's not you and it's all him, and your flaws are real, your limitations are real, your weaknesses are real, guess what you stop, guess what you start hearing? Guess what message you start hearing? The gospel. You start hearing true rest. You start hearing, my beloved son, I love you. You're a new man. 
You're perfect in who I made you. Yes, you still deal with the old man. He's a liar that you still live with, but my rest is greater. My power is greater. And those thoughts may come, but rest is in a person. Of course, it's in a position, and that's sonship. That you know you're a son, and it's a weapon, a powerful weapon of warfare, because no one could touch the rested spirit. It is the most powerful tool on earth today, the rested spirit in a man. And we, we, we close with the person. Rest is a person. I know many of you have heard this. Our Lord speaking, my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, meaning Jesus. For I, meaning Jesus, am gentle and humble. Don't you love that? That's fruit of spirit right there. I'm gentle and humble in heart, meaning in my motive, in my inner man, in my pure who I am. You're gentle and humble too in your new man. You desire, that's why you desire it. But our old man gets so rowdy sometimes. And you will find rest. If you take my yoke upon you, you will find rest for your souls. Okay? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, rest is a person. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It allows you, it allows you to do the very things that we spoke about. Be still in wonder of who God is and His gospel. Be submissive to His word. Be surrendered to His will. And be strengthened in His worth that He sticks in you as a man of God. Because that's where the true strength comes from. The reward of Christ is the rest in Christ. And that's how we, that's how we battle our thoughts. That's how we keep all our hearts clean. We first recognize. We then resist. We then, what do we do? Renounce. And then afterwards, we rest in acceptance that I am weak. I do have flaws. And the gospel is much louder than those voices. And what you'll see, those thoughts will be like a leaf going down a stream. Where you used to stop it here and start stomping on the leaf, if it was a thought, and a leaf would just stay there and break into pieces and get all messy. Now you just sit back. I am a son of God. That was my old man. That's not my new man. That's not who I am anymore. Thoughts, you keep coming. And you say that and uh, you're not commanded to. Here's what's going to happen. Your thoughts get diluted by the love of God, by the gospel. And you'll start thinking on these things. Philippians 4, 8. You'll start being able to think on these things, the whole list of, of beauty. Think on what is true and noble and just and lovely. You know, I try to find any other word for lovely for guys, but it didn't work out. But um, that's what we're able to do. God would not tell you to think on those things if he didn't give you the tools and his spirit to do that. This is how we battle the world's thoughts and the world's in, infection in our minds and come out, come of it as victory. This is how we fight our battles. For brainwashed, the battle for a man's mind. In Jesus' name. Men's Discipleship Network is touching lives by bringing the hope and freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ to men and their families. We want to thank all of you who are regular supporters of the ministry. Your continued financial and prayer support makes you a valuable partner in our work together. If you are being blessed by the teaching of men's pastor Scott Caesar, but are not yet supporting the ministry, please consider providing your financial support so that he and Men's Discipleship Network can continue its mission of changing families one man at a time. Make a commitment today to partner with MDN by scheduling recurring monthly donations on our website at mensdiscipleshipnetwork.com donate. 
Your regular support helps MDN pay for important programs and personnel needed to expand our ministry to men across the United States and around the world. Thank you for standing with us.